Today's episode is brought to you by the end of the NFL season. How are you going to just call a crackback block in the playoffs? It's overtime. Just let him play. It's high noon. Hello, everyone, and welcome to High Noon Podcast, the competitive Overwatch podcast. I am your host, Blevins. With me, maybe, as always, is Deathblow. Are you there? Just get a stapler <laughs> and staple the flag to his belt. I'm sick of referees. Let's talk about esports, Blevins. Uh, you're so mad that your camera exploded. I'm, I'm sure the podcast <laughs> listeners care, but that's why I was like, are you even here? <laughs> you <laughs> he just, it's a maybe. Your madness maybe. willed your camera out of existence. <laughs> just shaking. Uh, Ruck the Fefs has been called in the chat. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, welcome back, everyone. We are here. We I, I, we were, we're all riled up. I mean, let's just let's just jump right into it. We had the end of our football season for Buffalo, which I, I'm, I'm going to pause you right there, Deathblow. I'm going to I'll give you your soapbox. I'll, t- I'll take it you don't gotta I, give I it know. to me but I'll, I'll wait a little bit yeah um but uh yeah we got we we've got that to talk about as buffalo fans were you know obviously not super, it'll be brief we promise yeah not, not super <laughs> excited about the outcome of the saturday's playoff game but also it's just been like a ruckus going about in the overwatch league community lately and we're going to be talking about that a little bit, as well as our normal team preview. So stick around for those. Um, we've got our Blackwatch report. I got my, I got my handy Blackwatch report uh, buttons, so they can give us a little bit of insight on some of these roster changes from Tier 2. So that's going to be great. But uh, all right, DB, talk, talk, talk to me. What, what happened with us on, uh, on Saturday? Uh, it was a mix of a bunch of things, to be honest. There was a lot of us leaving opportunities on the field. Mm-hmm. Um, there was some referee shenaniganry, uh, and there was just Deshaun Watson out there making some really, really big plays um, in yeah. a big moment. You know, not to I'm not discrediting anything from the Houston side of things. Um, you know, they. Our, we were both very flawed teams going into that game. Mm-hmm. Spoiler alert: neither, even the Texans, neither team was had any chance of winning the Super Bowl this year. Right, um, but it was it was big for experience and things like that. And it was it was a game I really wanted. You know, it was a matchup that's winnable, and mm-hmm. and sometimes that first playoff win can elude a quarterback. So it's nice if you can get it right away when you get in there and, and you get your chance. You you want to take advantage of them when you can, squash some narratives, things like that. But. Um, you know, for the most part, we we showed up. I think we played better than them throughout the majority of the game. We just fell a little short by the end on the scoreboard. Mm-hmm. Um, all things considered, if I wasn't a part of a fan base that was a part of that game, it would have been a phenomenal football game. Oh, Super it was great to watch as someone who didn't have a huge vested interest in right. the outcome. It, it got to the point where it was just beautiful chaos, basically, is, mm-hmm. is what it was. And and as a fan of the teams, it was um, absolutely brutal to, to watch and go through. Um, but that's what we've been missing around here in Buffalo for a long time. Mm-hmm. So it's not much of a complaint. Um, I'll save my complaints for the refs and I'll, I'll do them quietly because we, we had our opportunities and we didn't make the most of them. Um, I feel like they did enough to win the game. Uh, they couldn't overcome the the difference from the from the refs, but um, yeah, end of the day, uh, they just didn't didn't quite get the job done, and uh, we've got a lot to look forward to next year. Um, it's a very very young team, so mm-hmm. go get go get me a big. Go, basically, go get me DK Metcalf, who I was screaming for them to draft uh, this last year, who had a big game this weekend, by the way, in, in his playoff match. Um, they just need a big physical wide receiver that that mm. you can throw to when he's covered. You know, Someone sometimes who's over six feet tall, maybe. Right, that would be great. <laughs> um, you know, we we've got one that's kind of of that body type, but like we he was 
from the CFL. And it's a weird situation that that player's in and um, not the most physically gifted. And I I want that top end elite wide receiving talent, uh, especially for a guy with as big an arm as as our QB has. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that's going to, that's going to wrap things up for me. I don't, I don't want to, I'm not, listen, if we did this podcast in the morning, there might've been a full two hours (laughs) of me going off about this game, but I've calmed down a lot over the course of the day. Yeah. Calmed down a lot over the course of the day. Um, I do really appreciate there was an outpouring or an outreach from you guys um, that while you were watching the game, some while it was going on, some as it ended and, mm-hmm. and you saw the results. Some people yep. just checking on my blood pressure around halfway through the fourth <laughs> quarter. Um, really did appreciate it, you guys. It, it did mean a lot. Um, I didn't get back to all of you on the day of the game because I was not, I was barely a functioning human being uh, <laughs> for about forty eight hours there, a little pre game and and post game. Um, yeah, you were so. you were a little quiet because usually like you'll you'll either message me about something or like something will be going on or I'll see you in one of the discords and you're just like gone. <laughs> Honest to God, I was playing Civ while watching uh, the other playoff games all weekend because I couldn't, honest to God, I couldn't watch the New England game, really. Like, I still, I'm going to go back and rewatch. It was on. I was looking mm-hmm. at it. I couldn't tell you what happened other than the score at the end. Right. Um, and really, the first game I was able to sit down and watch it all was was Sunday, like the Vikings game. I was a little bit. But even then, like, literally, I would, a couple drives, I would just, like, be, I would just glaze over staring at the screen and then, like, half wake up like i was literally it's been a long time since we've been a serious playoff team and uh, two years ago when we were in it we weren't serious we were mm-hmm. there but we weren't a serious team yep um and so i didn't expect to win and i i was into it but not not like this we we've got an honest to god real team now um so i was i really wanted that game and i i've really never in my adult life certainly you know it was very very, very young going through it before to the mm-hmm. point where i probably didn't know what I was as really experiencing. Um, I didn't know how I'd do with that. Not great, not terribly, but not great. If anybody <laughs> was wondering, um, yeah. very stressful. I, I look forward to, to getting back and learning to cope a little better though. <laughs> so it's a young, it's a young team, like you said, and that's good. Very young. Yeah. Let's just hope that the, uh, uh, the front office and coaching staff does not. Well, actually the coaching staff has been really good. We, Hopefully yeah. the front office we, doesn't make a bunch of stupid decisions or like, have talks about shipping Allen or something stupid like that. I don't know if it, any of that's it could going go on. drastically. That won't happen, but it could go drastically <clears throat> in either direction because we have a lot of money in our salary cap. A mm-hmm. lot, a lot of money. Yeah. More than probably anybody else that was in the playoffs this year. Um, and that can mean big players that make a big difference, or they can mean big paychecks that don't make any difference to your right. team and and handcuff you for years. So it's a very, very important off season for the bills, but I'm, I'm optimistic. This, the front office has been very good for us. So. That, that's good. And, uh, you can definitely jump in the uh, high noon podcast, discord, discord, me slash high noon podcast. We have a sports channel in there and it's, it's, it's pretty active. If you're a traditional sports fan and also an esports, actually it, you honestly don't I mean you're not listening to this if you're not an esports fan, but you really don't even need to be an Overwatch fan to come in and talk about sports or whatever you want. All sorts of sports going on there. Uh if you want to talk about traditional sports, which I know a lot of you know, it's it's not as common, of course, in in our world of esports, but I think there are few places that have a bigger population of traditional sports fans than the High New Podcast Discord. Listen, it's something we purpose. I know you guys are thinking like, I'm, this is an Overwatch League podcast. How many minutes are we we going to spend on the NFL? Just so you guys know, we've had people reach out to us and say they really enjoy that aspect of things. They think oh, it really helps connect the show. If if you're not one of those people, our, our apologies. Um, you can usually, we do try to, to limit it. We don't always lose in the playoffs. So uh, this will be <laughs> the longest conversation about yeah. traditional sports we have. Um, and to be honest, you won't hear it mentioned probably for a good little while other than mm-hmm. anecdotes or comparisons. Um, but if it ever does come up and it's not for you, just give it a two minute, three minute bump on the, the track bar or something. Yeah. We'll, we'll be through it before long. But if you do like it, you know, we, we love that we can connect with you guys in that way. Um, and we like that we've been able to connect 
connect the dots for a lot of people that got mm-hmm. into esports and Overwatch League from a traditional sports yeah. background, and and um, that feels a little bit like our our lot in the community mm-hmm. and our place and our home. Um, so that's why we do it. If you're a little frustrated by it, our apologies. Please, please skip forward. Um, but yeah, we we love talking about it. So never hesitate to to reach out to us or interact or roast us or whatever you want to do yeah. relating to traditional sports. Absolutely. There's a lot of places you can go and listen to not hear that. And there's very few that you can listen to. And it is there. So we're going to be that one, at least some some episodes. Uh, <laughs> but uh I don't actually have anything more to say about football, so we'll move on. Um, but uh, for me, I did actually watch that game, and uh, here's my take. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, no, I, I actually did watch the game, but uh, I didn't have uh, – I was just watching it recreationally. I mean, I wanted the Bills to win, but um, besides that, been playing a lot of TFT still. Um, I had a really bad night yesterday, just like – one of those days where I just like felt like I forgot how to play the game just like, and like not only that, but also like getting in those frustrations where you're like, okay, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to force this comp and just like every single time picking the wrong thing. Just like, I'm going to go in and it's a bad way to play for those of you who don't know. It's a bad way to go in, to go in and just force a thing bad in that game. Um, but I'm just like, this is one of them. (laughs) This is one of them. Uh, and it was just like, okay, I'm going to force this. Oh, there's two other people going it. Well, I didn't scout enough because I'm not, I'm like getting tilted a little bit, but, um, at the end of the day, like I lost some, I lost some rank, but I'm like motivated to get better. Cause it's like, I know that it's just me playing poorly, which is, I, I guess it's like kind of a good thing that like, I just know it's me playing poorly. Cause I know I can improve. So, um, what's, what's your rank at? Uh, I fell down to plat three. So you did pass me. Damn it. <laughs> oh yeah. I was at plat. I was at plat two. I was actually almost at plat one for a while. And then I, I like toyed around in plat two for a long time and then fell down to plat three. Oh, I'll catch you tonight. Maybe. Um, unless we're playing in the same game. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so been doing that and, uh, been doing some other content with, uh, TFT. If you're into TFT, I actually did interview the, lead designer of the game Mort Dog, so you can check that out if you'd like i can send you the link uh or and just got interviewed by giant slayer tv no big deal yeah i did I, well that, that that's not really that wasn't really an interview um that was, that was a that was an, a faux interview a, sh- uh, a sham review a sham review um that was that was that was interesting but i've been doing a lot of voiceover stuff for them too so uh, a lot of content for me if you hate me then man this is a bad time to be in <laughs> tft because i'm everywhere now uh but uh enough about that well, last thing okay i mean i should just point out some oh, things are, oh, oh, are happening oh, oh. here podcast viewers won't know but i am holding up pc components i've got my cooler i've got my power supply i've got three terabytes of hard drive space Ooh. over here i used to have three terabytes of hard drive space <laughs> now i'm down to two. 64 <laughs> gigs of ram Woo. i am getting very very close the video Swimming card in. the video literally i'm having trouble holding it on i don't know why i got myself into you this you could have just descri- described it <laughs> yes it's it's an audio show but i want i'm excited i wanted to hold it up and i'm an idiot what percent um, completion are you at right now and when is your estimated day close. when's the day so the case and the uh video card are supposed to arrive wednesday um so that means i'll likely not be working thursday to i was gonna say it. are you t- um and then i might take friday off because i'll have a new computer as well so um, what you're saying is i'm working from your house on thursday yeah. <laughs> i can do it i can do it uh we will let's wait until we get it um, or you bring all the stuff to my house and pick up your stupid statue while you're at it or bring the statue um because i'm not no, bringing not i'm not bringing all the components to <laughs> your house to build it to then pack it up and bring it home <laughs> that's stupid uh, hey, i pr- i'm giving andres an equal i'm giving i play games an equal equal shot at getting this you got to come here i will shoot that plane down on its way from atlanta uh <laughs> if i have to 
but uh, for the record we have yeah. no actual intents of shooting down a plane this is a joke just for the for the government for the three government employees listening right now thanks for that lie um but <laughs> uh, for the record yeah, it's not a lie I'm, I'm really excited the the big thing that i'm worried about um is the gpu brace I wouldn't, I wouldn't be me if I had just bought in a $5 piece of plastic that would mm. prop up the GPU and prevent it from sagging. I bought an RGB piece of plastic that will hold it up and will light up the Ooh. Blizzard Entertainment logo inside the PC. Nice. It's going to look super sweet once I get it, but it's coming from like China or Korea and I paid for faster shipping, but it's, I think that one's going to take a little while. But that said, I'll be able to build it and put a piece of plastic in it that'll hold it up. If I, right. I have a temporary thing. I'm not waiting to build it for that. I'll add that afterwards. Yeah. Um, but that's really the big hangup. So, yeah, it's, it should be by the time we're recording next week's episode, I should be physically on the new computer while we're doing it. So, fingers Ooh. crossed, knocking on wood to make sure I've had a a lot of weird luck with this whole thing um but yes super super pumped uh it is absolutely happening and it's happening fast as you can see earlier with the boxes that i piled up on me <laughs> yeah so that 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 will definitely be exciting and uh guys make sure you yell at deathblow in uh in discord and tell him to make some more make some more videos make vod reviews make something do it Blevins knows my stuff. plans. Yeah. Um, so does Thorn Rain. I've reached out to a couple people just to to start the process a little bit here. Um, definitely, definitely planning on attacking the new Overwatch leaks. Like the timing is too perfect. Um, mm -hmm. it, it could be ugly. It might not be good at the beginning, um, but I'm just going to start doing it and putting it out. And if it becomes too much work and blah, 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 I might drop projects, pick up new ones. I don't know. It's going to be fast. It's going to be crazy. I'm going to figure out what I'm doing, but I really want to learn a lot of video editing. And I want that to mean more in-depth Overwatch League content on the High Noon brand. Uh, I think you guys have earned that for sticking with us for mm -hmm. it's been literally over four years we've been yeah. doing the show long long time but that is all to come in the coming weeks let's move on here and talk about a little bit there we go um we have got some big news here we'll start off with a couple of uh one-offs so jexay joined the houston outlaws BB, I know you're you you claim you you claim you called this one, but I don't I don't recall ever hearing it. That's fine. You were the only other person on the call at the time, so why would you know? <laughs> um, I mean, it was on recording. You can you can go back. Uh, it, listen, this wasn't hard to call, right? Plat Chat called it. A lot of people put the put two and two together on mm -hmm. this one. The fact that he didn't have a home, the fact that all the outlaws did was resign Boink, um, and the fact that they were waiting on news, right? Like they were even talking about it. We're not planning on being done, but right now we're at 12 sort of a thing. And then when Jake retired, it, it became very easy, I think, to um, one plus one equals two, this this particular signing. So not claiming to have a big old wrinkly brain or anything like that, but I, I called this as I wanted it very early. And then I called it that it was happening um, not too long ago. Um, this is big. Listen, um, of all the signings, of all the things the Outlaws had done, regardless of what you think of the bench players on their roster, the one thing I thought they needed to address in the offseason was shot calling. Um, mm -hmm. It was rumored. I don't know how true it was. I think Jake was very vocal and very important to team synergy and communication. I don't think he was their in-game shot caller. Um, but regardless, even if he was, uh, with him retiring, they needed to get somebody in to, to fill that role. Um, Jack say and, and main support is typically where you want that role to be. I'm mm -hmm. um, going to be curious to see. This is another Korean player going into a mixed roster. If he's your shot caller or your comms in Korean now, um, and how does that affect the other players, things like that. I, I think Jack say speaks decent English. I, I don't know for sure. Um, he didn't have a lot of incentive to give English interviews and things like that when he right. played for the Seoul Dynasty. So I guess we're right. going to find out with a quickness. Um, I'm sure some people know as well. So feel free to throw that in a comment or in Discord if you, you're familiar with uh, how good his, his English is. But um, this is another signing that it, it adds good talent to the roster. Um, Boink was, I think, fine mechanical skill-wise, but not from the shot calling perspective. So uh, I really think this is probably a starting roster shakeup here for mm -hmm. Houston. 
And uh, I think it's it's going to just help give them more of that upside that, that we really needed to see, you know, even me as a fan and liking all the shake, the, the changes, the shakeups, the new directions, I had a very hard time thinking of them as more than maybe a high end play ins team. Um, and I think this gives them the upward capability, still not going to predict it to be mm-hmm. up there towards the top, to be in that top six locked in for a playoff spot. It's that's something that I think is much more, much more possible now. Um, still not maybe likely until you really see the pieces all fit and start to work before you're going to really predict something like that. Um, But this was the big, uh, the big piece that they didn't address yet. So great to see it uh, finally addressed here. And uh, listen, Jexay played for, um, for soul last Mm -hmm. year, a good amount. He was a Lucio. It's hard to tell uh, exactly what kind of impact they're having uh, mm-hmm. for some of them. You know, obviously, you got guys like Masa that came in and and was very apparent right away. So maybe this isn't a world beater from the main support, but I think it represents something that the team didn't have um, in a potentially really strong shot caller that can can lead them um, through the actual games and and matches and maps um, from the stage. So I think if they can find that, there's a lot of of upward. Um, upward momentum or possibility uh, Mm -hmm. for the Houston Outlaws here. Yeah. And uh, we'll save our full analysis for when we go over them, but yeah, I mean, big, big, uh, big move for them. And like you said, there was a little bit of a, an opening there in the roster, maybe some soft spot, if you will. And uh, they filled it. So that's good. Good on them to do that. Speaking of things that are good on them, Big one here. I was not expecting this to actually happen. And in fact, I thought it was a troll the first time I saw it. But the Florida Mayhem have officially changed their color scheme and branding over to the the teal and pink, like, 80s Miami Vice colors. And they now have hashtag light it up. They've changed their they changed their colors. Your in-game Overwatch League skins are changing to these colors. Actually, I don't know if they're changing. I don't know if you have to buy new ones or not. We don't know how that's going to work. Don't know how that's going to work. But they'll they, be added. They're going to be in the game in one form or another. Um, and they had this. They 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 posted a tweet that had uh, a couple paragraphs on it going over what uh, what the change is, why they did it, blah blah blah. But the one thing I wanted to point out was. These represent more than just a simple rebranding. They represent a commitment to our core philosophies, our desire to change, and the energy we intend to bring in the 2020 season. Forget the mayhem. gum, cotton candy energy. What? Forget about what you know. Forget what you know about the mayhem. What we're bringing to the table is something entirely new, and it starts with the greatest color scheme, best content, strongest competitive spirit, blah, 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 blah. Um, I mean great good on them Listen, for doing, we're, doing we're on record we love these jerseys they i own look one. awesome yeah blevins got one he was in a photo shoot with aspen just because he was wearing one or True. whatever was going on over there yeah. you know so we're, we're we're big fans of the jerseys uh at least i can say that much yeah. um i don't like the colors generally speaking on other things and personally i thought I like the them in that screenshots i saw well, yeah, with a heavy black background yes. and like the you know the thin piping lines within, it looks yeah, great the on the jersey. Wave, yeah, I think it looks pretty bad on the skins. I'm going to just defer to my color blindness on this one because <laughs> when I first saw some stuff from Hang Zhao, I didn't even think the colors matched. I thought it was hideous and just didn't make well, any sense. I was very you know, confused. You're not that wrong. <laughs> I don't, I, don't think, I I tend to agree with the color scheme, but even for that color scheme, it looked especially bad to me right to be honest it didn't look like that color scheme it looked like a really failed attempt to get anywhere near that color scheme Mm -hmm. in in my broken eyes i'm gonna assume that's the same thing here because in the in the end game skins they look terrible to me um from the pictures i saw but the jerseys are great and that's to me the most important thing they're Mm -hmm. they're getting those jerseys as their primaries which is going to be great for the sale of their jerseys and Mm -hmm. um everything like that and um when you fail for a while which they have for two years um sometimes the the makeover the uh you know the visual uplift mm-hmm. can can make a difference um 
you know, look good, feel good, feel good, play good. Yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. maybe there's something to that. I really don't know how that impacts um, esports players. I know there are some traditional athletes that really believe in that. You'll find them wearing gold chains and watches oh, yeah. and that cost forty thousand mm -hmm. dollars on, a, on a, a football field. Um, but yeah, I don't know. So it, it's not a bad thing in any capacity. Right. Um, it, it's just getting them, I think, closer to where they want to be. So um, it's great. And yeah, the jerseys do look awesome. So if you are a Florida fan, now's the time. Florida has seemed like one of those. I mean, it might just be that we know a bunch of people in the scene that are Florida fans. So our 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 view might be skewed. But it always seemed like Florida fans were like they're there and they're like organized in, 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 in ways, but they're not like, it's, it's hard because they've been so bad for so long. And, uh, I mean, I think it's nice to see even like, I mean, you read the, you read that and it's like, okay, it's obviously a PR message and like, Oh, well, we're changing here. Everything you knew about our old team, which was, uh, horrible by the way, uh, is gone. We've completely wiped clean, brand new slate, blah, blah, blah. All that, like, you know, all the platitudes and whatnot. Okay. That, that's fine. But, like, it's nice to see that from the org. They didn't need to do that. They didn't need to make a change. This is a change that people have been asking for since they unveiled the original team, right? Like, uh, it turns out that McDonald's colors, not super great. The Just, like, everything about it. And, like, if I'm a Mayhem fan, this is great. Like... You see a rebranding, like like you said, feel good, play good, play good, like our feel, look good, feel good, blah blah blah. Just moving stuff around, just changing stuff is gonna be good for you, just psychologically. Like they're going into the say, new philosophy. Watching you flub that line yeah. while wearing a shirt that says nothing special on your chest yeah. uh, was particularly entertaining. By yep. the way, I, I knew the audio listeners wouldn't have got this. I had to point out. Oh yeah, just exactly what you're wearing. It's nothing you special. Talk. When you're not able to get out, look good, feel good, feel good, play good. <laughs> look good, feel good, feel good, play good. I never heard it like that before. So I'm... look nothing special. <laughs> look nothing special. Play like nothing feel special. Nothing special play are like nothing that. special. That's how it is. That's my new motto. Um, someone make that into a shirt and send it to me, please. Um, <laughs> but I forgot. No. Um, just just changing changing it up and and, and hearing that from the org, it's just good for you know, maybe the morale of the players or it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a new slate, right? Like take the old seasons. They're gone. They're, they're in the past. They were a different team. They're even different colors. Like even if it's just a psychological thing, it's like, we're a brand new thing. We're moving forward. It's good. I think it'll help the fan base. I mean, it's getting a lot of talk. No one else that we, no one else has at least announced branding changes. So this is like what we have to talk about right now. Uh, or at least it would be if there wasn't some other things that we'll be talking about in a minute. But you know, I think it's a good thing. And I think it, obviously this comes at um, probably an extreme cost. Um, although this stuff is pretty much pre-made. Like the like, it's not that hard to do this aesthetic. It's not like they they reinvented the wheel. But um, yeah, I, I think it's good. And I think um, you know it. it but if I was a mayhem fan, I'd be uh, I'd be very uh, very happy about this. But now show some changes on the stage, and then give right. us something actually substantive to talk about. Sure, please and thank you, Florida. Yes, um, things that also make me very happy is that we finally got the announcement. ZP is going to be casting in the Overwatch League in 2020 alongside Jake. Big, huge grats to GP. One of the OGs of uh, competitive Overwatch. I mean, the old Hex ZP combo we've talked about. We've had both of them on the show. We've talked about them for literally years now. Just, just really glad to see um, both of them in the in the league now, and just just a long time coming. Do you have the blood soaked hammer trap ready in the new setup? No, I don't. I don't even have it Damn. ready on the old setup. Let me down, Blevins. Um, yeah, no, we're, we've been big ZP fans for a long time. Um, it was bad timing slash unlucky circumstances that kept him out uh, when the league launched. He's been 
just doing a phenomenal job holding down the tier two scene from a casting perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, so big thanks to him for, for doing the whole overwatch league scene, a service and mm-hmm. sticking with the game uh, when he didn't get the call up for the league I'm ecstatic to see that pay off for him um, and to see him make his way into the league here. Um, so yeah, unfortunately there was room made for him. We'll get into that in a minute, but yep. um, yeah, it was a, great to see. Um, Jake coming in as well. We we've seen this duo together uh, in the past. They did a really good job. I'm really excited to see them grow and continue casting and and continue working on that duo dynamic that they've started at the World Cup. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, very excited to see ZP. Excited to see Jake. Excited to see them all uh, in this upcoming season. The next ones. This one's not gotten as much attention, but is part of the whole picture, and we'll kind of. We'll devote a good we'll devote a decent amount of time to this. Um so the first one is Puckett has left the desk to freelance. Um, at least part of, if not the majority of the reason, is that his wife took a job in New York City, which caused him to need to relocate. Uh freelancing just makes more sense for him and where he's at in his career makes a lot of sense. You know, you can't it's it's certainly not conducive to fly out to uh California for or wherever they're gonna be doing the desk. Um, so he's in New York city doing, uh, freelance and maybe we'll see him at some points. Maybe he'll be like the golden boy of this season or come in here or there, or maybe he'll, um, you know, work the New York games or something. We don't know. Um, but what we do know is that he is no longer full time with them. And also Monte Cristo and Doa have also declined to re up their contracts uh, they've each cited creative differences in the league's hesitance to listen to experienced esports professionals as the main reason, uh, as well as some other things. They both have twit longer. I, I know Doa has a twit longer. I think Monty yeah. either has a twit longer or a long thread on Twitter. You can definitely check that. I'm sure you already have if you're listening to this. If not, just check their Twitters. They have uh, posted those. And uh, this has kind of gotten the scene, and not even just the – not even just the diehards that are, uh, you know, competitive Overwatch subreddit and, you know, the people who are watching and, uh, you know, following the scene all the time. This has gotten the the bigger esports people in. So, you know, you're, we're getting our Richard Lewis's, our Thorin's, our Slashers, our we're getting that next level, the uh, bigger esports scene talking about this and uh, proclaiming doom and gloom for the overwatch league, uh, in large part from this. So I know death blow, you've got, uh, you got some thoughts here on this one. Yeah. I mean, first and foremost, we're really sad to see these guys go. Yeah. Um, they are both characters and absolute hardened professionals at mm-hmm. their craft. Um, that is a ridiculously difficult line to walk and they've set the gold standard for how it should be done by broadcasters, both inside esports, outside of esports. I, I really think um, both of them are world class commentators. Mm-hmm. Uh, Overwatch, the game, and the league are hurt by their departure. There's no debating that. Okay, I want to start by that. Um, but as much as we're sad to see them go, we really want to talk about their reasons. Um, both of them were very clearly recruited and, and brought in by Nate Nanzer mm-hmm. as he formed the league and got it started. It was mm-hmm. Nate's vision and Nate's plan that brought them in and got them on board. Nate left, but they had contracts that needed to, to run their course. Okay. Um, sounds like they met with the new commissioner and the new commissioner is a traditional sports guy. He's coming and and bringing that approach to the league and to the broadcast. We will never have the exact details about this. Um, but it, it does confuse me a little bit because Nate was the one who sold this to me as esports entering the world of traditional sports. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the way it was advertised and and what sold me and what brought me here. And Blevins, I think the same is true for you. And I'm pretty sure it brought us both into overwatch and it drove us to starting this podcast. We looked at overwatch and we said, this looks like a top down flagship esports product. It's exactly what we want to be a part of. And so Mm -hmm. we showed up and we started to make content for it. Um, I would love to know what the the specifics are and form a full opinion on this, but it's just not possible. So this is a half form opinion and everybody's opinion on this particular topic, other than Monty, Doa, 
uh, and anybody else, right. you know what I mean? People that are behind the yeah. non-disclosure agreement right. and know the details. Those are the only ones that have a fully formed opinion on it, okay? Um, and that's what's got people alarmed because they really trust and respect Monty and those opinions on esports. And so the fact that they don't see eye to eye, but anyways, regardless, we're in this league and it's set up, the infrastructure, everything is here. We're, we're much closer to a traditional sports league um than we are kind of your your average or your traditional esports league or, or platform tournament series whatever it is right. however you want to word it right mm -hmm. um so we're, we're already here and to me it's it's crazy to think why would we backtrack now i've done i've not seen the numbers that tell me overwatch league is in danger or overwatch league is failing mm -hmm. i've only seen numbers submit like minutes we use the the new metric that the tv stations use right like average minutes watched right it takes away their ability to inflate things by oh well we people were mad oh they put it in the ad or they put it in the launcher of the blizzard app so that it artificially spikes views not with this metric right so we have what i believe are the most reliable metrics we can to show the league is growing its its viewer base so what is the what is the cause here? What is the catalyst that's telling us we need to to switch and change direction and go back to being a traditional esport? Uh, to me, it looks like it's working. And when we really have this conversation and sit down and look at it, I just I just can't understand why we would possibly retreat at this moment, right? It's home games, guys. Twenty twenty, we're mm -hmm. here. We got to it. This is the key. Okay, when when this whole thing got started um i thought that this season was the linchpin the the make it make it or break it season right yep. because what did we open the show with 20 minutes of me lamenting the loss of a, of a bill's playoff game because i couldn't have focused i couldn't have gotten through the show literally i really don't think i could have had we not had that conversation and i got it out of my system <laughs> and, and then we can move on right mm -hmm. and that's because i'm tied to my city right my team that i'm I feel like I'm owned by them. Like I don't have a choice. I, I have to be a Bills fan. And we're never going to get that level of commitment, that level of interaction, that level of support from the fans until we go to them. Um, and so this is the season where we're finally doing that. This is the season where we can make big strides. Listen, if you want to tell me the Overwatch League isn't going well and viewership only marginally goes up after this year, I'll, I'll listen to that argument. But if you want to tell me marginal growth in a year that saw sure some expansion teams but like the exact same thing as the year before mm -hmm. and like every everything in la and and we still saw that increase so to me that's a win now you need to talk about you know is the growth enough to to match what we're doing now that we're here in the markets and mm -hmm. um so to me the we're just beginning, right? This is essentially season one in a lot of ways for yep. me and how I'm going to analyze and view the league and, and measure its success because it couldn't have been a success until we were in the home markets, playing in front of the fans, putting the the, the players and the fans in the same room. Um, that's that's huge. That's very, very important. Um, now they're, they're going to be spending time there during the season to promote the brand, uh, to interact with the fans, to meet mm -hmm. with them. This is where it's got to work. This isn't the time to change course. This is the time to double down, to reinvest, to to go hard into these these home stands and to, and to do whatever you possibly can to make them a success. And to have have shown up for two seasons and to leave because you wanted it to go back. And I don't know. This is what they did. I'm just saying. To, if if that's what they did, right? They said, well, we think we should stay in LA and, and all the games should be on land in one location and all these things. And that's that's crazy to me. Yeah. That's admitting defeat. That's forfeiting. That's waving a white flag. Blizzard and, and the team owners have way too much money invested in this, I think, to be okay with that. So if that costs us some casting talent at the end of the day, you're more expendable than the teams, than the owners, than the players. I, I love our casting talent. I'm mm -hmm. I, all of them, including the guys that are on their way out the door. Um, we can live without you, right? Like you can't tell me that Doa and Monty leaving means that an esport dies. I can go watch League of Legends right now right. and tell you that that's not enough that right. doesn't end in esports somebody will take that mantle we're getting more sideshow and bren now 
we're getting ZP called up, we're getting Jake. Um, I don't think anybody's worried about whether or not these guys can handle it, whether or not these guys can do a good job casting, uh, casting tournaments and casting matches. So uh, the casting talent can come and go. I'm not, I'm sorry, Richard Lewis, I'm, I'm going to invoke the name. Okay, you're too biased to get to have an opinion about Overwatch League, right? Anybody that's gone out of their way to block Dante's mother on Twitter, okay, <laughs> or hydrate some of them. Like, he's out yeah. there blocking owl moms. Why? You don't want to see them support because their children? the Overwatch League is dead. And so Richard Lewis has spoken, and so, <laughs> and so it is true. Um, that's not how this works. Like, I, t don't – somebody tweeted this article to me, and, and I, it's by all means, don't mean to um, – ask you not to do anything like that uh, this isn't directed at, at you who, who linked it to me but it's don't come at me with articles by the most biased people that before a single game was played was writing doom and gloom articles about the league right. the man's right. been rooting for it to fail since minute one okay i'm not putting any stock in a word that comes out of the man's mouth unless it's positive about the league because that would mean something happened that you know what i mean like something major right like shifted but if you just think it's it's a joke then you just can't come in and say later on that you you know i don't know anyways I'm, I'm losing my train of thought um but it's it's fine if you are that negatively invested in the league failing i'm not going to take your opinion on it of something that just has no it's not an indicator of of doom and, or gloom or failure or anything like that just i just don't understand how you can put stock in, in that man's opinion when he writes that article. And I don't know how it can snowball like this. Um, listen, be sad Monty and Doha are leaving. Follow them where they go. Mm -hmm. um, don't assume anything as a result of them leaving, right? Like it, it to me just doesn't make sense. Commentators aren't the linchpin of any eSport league. Right. None, none of them are, are propping up any leagues anywhere. And I don't think that's what was happening with Overwatch League. If I'm wrong, I'll I'll eat the words. It'll be very apparent in the numbers. I just can't imagine that's going to be the case. Yeah, the, the, the problem is that, like, people have, people from other esports and other, uh, other games have a vested interest in Overwatch League succeeding, right? Because it is, like, it's billed as the marquee, the marquee thing right you we've we have the world stage we have all these investors we have uh millions and millions and tens of millions of dollars invested in this league so if it fails if it fails it looks bad for everyone not just overwatch not just blizzard it looks bad for esports so i for, on one hand i understand why people are uh worried about overwatch and like like you said, Monty and Doa leaving is not a good thing. No one like you could you don't look at that and go, "Oh, well, the league is de that's a definite improvement. This is making me think good things." Like it makes me think not good things, right? It makes me think like and especially the things they said, blah blah blah, uh, you know, philosophical differences whatever, like none of that makes me think a good thing, right? It does not make me jump to the conclusion that the Overwatch League is dead. It does not make me jump to the conclusion that Season 3 is going to be a failure. It does not make me jump to any of these conclusions. Why would it? Like, how... We don't know how the uh, the homestands are going to... We don't know how to evaluate how the homestands are going to be. We haven't been to any. We haven't been to... Home, we've, we've had three homestands... The Dallas one and the Atlanta one, I think, were absolutely successes, and the LA one was all right. I've heard. Why would I? Why and all ev both uh, both grand finals have sold out. Why would I think it's going to fail based on people people leaving? Like it, it, there's so much more that we don't know. And like I get why, I get why people would be afraid of it failing, but I don't know why you would say that it's going to based on that. It just doesn't make sense to me. Like you, it, I, I really don't. Is it because that Overwatch League is taking a chance? Like no one's saying that they're not taking a chance. No one is saying that it's a guaranteed success, but like 
if you're wanting the success for esports and you want the success for Overwatch League, like, would you not try to help that and not point out? I I just don't know. And like I, the thing I, I I skimmed through the article from Richard Lewis, and I think he brought up a bunch of factually correct things, and drew. Uh, and overstepped on the conclusions that he drew. That's what I would say about that article. Um, so, and I mean, it, it's his opinion. It's a, it's an op-ed, whatever. That's, that's fine. I don't think it helps anyone. I don't think it helps Overwatch League. What, am, what am I supposed to do with that information? That's what I want to know. If, if it's like, oh well, this is doom and gloom for the Overwatch League. Okay. If that's your opinion, and I'm taking your opinion, let's say, okay, I, okay, what do I do with that? That's what I want to know. Maybe he says it in the article. I'm I'm not going to... I didn't read the whole thing because it was very long and I got the gist of it at the beginning. <laughs> so maybe I need to read the whole article. But uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm biased in that I want the Overwatch League to succeed. I'm open about that. I want it to succeed. I'm very excited about it. I've invested okay. a ton of time and effort into this game and into the community and into the league. I want it to succeed, and I'm biased about that, and I'm okay with that. That's fine. Um, and you know, I'll do my part to help it succeed. And yeah, and I don't, I don't write articles about how every time they sign anybody to anything, how it's such a positive sign for the league, and it's a beacon of positivity, and all these things, because it would be a biased piece of trash for people to read. And that my only contention is that it's the bias that makes it trash. So when you have that, if you're a journalist and you have that ridiculously strong opinion on either side, positive or negative, you've kind of lost your credibility as a journalist to report unbiased opinions. Cause that's to me what journalism needs to be. Okay. If it's, if it's an op-ed, if it is an opinion piece if like whatever bias is fine in those, I don't, I don't care, but I'm not giving it because of the bias. I'm not giving it any credibility. I'm not giving it the time of day because I don't think he gave the league a fair shake from minute one, right? So right. why I'm, I'm not going to give his article a fair shake from minute one. To me, that's fair. I've already been called a clout chaser once in Twitch chat. And I don't care. <laughs> As I said in Twitch chat, everybody in the world is a clout, ch clout chaser because otherwise just go get your minimum wage job at McDonald's and be happy for the rest of your life. That's the most non-insulting insult anybody's ever thrown wait. at me before. Uh, and I, I just wait. don't care. I'm sorry. I just, yes. This... I would like to make a name for myself. I would like it to Does... be in esports. That sounds fun to me. Does like, someone think that a podcast is clout? Because that person is just horrifically uninformed. Right. If that's the case. Um, but long story short, um, again, like again, the people leaving and the reasons they gave are not a positive thing. And I personally have had my doubts about things I've seen, people leaving, et cetera, et cetera. Like I've I've seen this stuff. I see the same stuff that all you guys see. I see the same thing. I don't probably don't see as much as Richard Lewis because I'm not as connected as him, but I see those things and I agree that there's a lot of things that aren't good. But here's the thing in the way that media works today, not just not just esports media, though, maybe specific more specifically esports and gaming media. Like if you're not being talked about, if you're not trending, if you're not on the top of the list, people think that you're dead. That's just the way that media works. So when nothing is happening, when Overwatch 2 is 500 years away, we don't know, when nothing is happening in the Overwatch League offseason uh, and there's uncertainty and there's a big thing happening and then something not positive comes up, it gets, it gets jumped to uh, it's doom and gloom and, and Overwatch League is dead. And it's like, well... You need to go go to a homestand first. <laughs> like seriously, I like, honestly I think we've probably given it we've given it more time than I think it actually deserves just because it's such a prevalent thing. It's such a big thing right now. But like it it's to me it feels like the same people who complain. It's like oh man, they changed the Twitter interface. It's garbage now. Twitter's garbage. The interface is terrible. Can you believe how bad this Twitter interface is? Holy crap. Like I see this all the time and I'm like, yeah, but didn't you say this the last time that they changed the interface? And then the time before that? And then the time before that? And then the time before that? Like, don't didn't you say this every single time they changed something? And then two weeks later you literally don't even remember what it used to look like? 
It's like, well, it's like, yeah, well, why don't you just give it like give the homestands a try? And when it's a success, then you don't have to look like an idiot and people are going to be like, oh, well, you we, you thought it was going to be a failure. It's like, just wait, call it a failure after the fa- after the fact, like a true hero, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I we get worked up about it because it's just it's just silly to me. Um, and I, I feel like people just have a really. They just have really silly takes, and I get why you would do that because you need clicks, you need to create content, and I get that. But it's like you're not helping anybody, and that that's not that's not good. So, and to be clear, I we don't have any problem with Richard Lewis, and I was more negative than than you were. I I don't I don't know anything about the man. I don't I don't care. I have no, nothing positive or negative to say about him. The only thing I really know about him is that he really hates Overwatch League. Like, as, and I don't hate him for that. Like, I love it. You don't like it. Great. We don't have to have conversations about it. I'm just talking about injecting his opinion. I'm sick of being asked to answer or respond to his opinion or his article when I, it's just, to me, not credible in the space and and that's that's what's frustrating that's what i'm crapping on not the man i don't care if, if you like him by, by all means if you thought it was a worthy read you agree with him i'm all for it i just don't see it myself when i look at it and i don't view him as a credible source and yeah. he's the biggest name that wrote about it and that's so that's why we brought him up yeah let me know what you guys think about my opinion on that and uh and uh what uh i don't know uh, I'm because I, I I don't know I, I feel like I elaborated on mine but maybe I'm maybe I'm uninformed I don't know let me know but let's move on here and let's get off of this topic and instead oh come on buttons this isn't my fault this is the computer's fault I blame my computer not me ah <laughs> uh, let's talk about the Guangzhou charge. DB, what do we got for roster moves? Well, starting out, they lost Hotba, Fraggy, Bishu, and Only Wish, and then Rise retired as well. Um, to replace that list, they brought in Krong, WYA, and Neptuno. Um, Krong comes from, I believe, O2 Blast. Uh, he's the only uh flex tank on this team the only off tank here so he is going to start um neptuno obviously we know as well from um his time with the philly fusion so i think that's a really really interesting signing as well um but probably not the it's really hard to tell what they're going to do with this roster um Mm -hmm. going forward uh chara was listed as the captain last year of this team um, mm-hmm. And he's the main support that that's still there. I personally think Neptuno is a better player, um, but leadership, shot calling, all those things, very important. We talked about that a little bit already today. Um, so do you disrupt that by bringing in somebody like Neptuno? It's going to be really interesting to see how that works out here for Guangzhou. Um, taking a look last year, they were 15 and 13 in their match record that got them the ninth seed. So they did have to try to make it in through the play-ins, which they were unable to do. Uh, as far as maps go, they had a 59% map win percentage on control, 52 on assault, 50 on hybrid and 43 on escort. Uh, bad maps in particular, Paris was a 10% win rate. Hanamura was 40. Dorado was 0% Levens. That's 0 and 4. Yikes. Um, Junkertown, 25, Gibraltar, 33, Rialto, 43, Oasis, 20, Numbani, 20, Blizzard World, 30. The lists of bad maps are getting much longer as we go down these standings Mm -hmm. here, Blevins. Um, So to me, Guangzhou is a very interesting case. I didn't want them to make drastic changes going into this year. Um, That was a little bit on the surface um, prior to knowing what the other teams were doing, right? Um, Before we knew how much a lot of other teams at least potentially improved, right? Um, You know, you you really thought their constant, uh, consistent improvement that they were making throughout 2019 might have been able to carry over and and work its way into 2020 and allow them to keep growing. But they did lose both of their off tanks. Um, Let's hear what Blackwatch Report has to say here on Guangzhou before we give our opinions. Guangzhou Charge uh, made two pickups from Tier 2. They picked up first is an off-tank named Krong from O2 Blast. I think this guy was actually pretty solid. Um, O2 Blast has been up and down in the past, but I think he was always pretty consistent. 
I think he's going to be a, a really solid player for them. Um, I think definitely going to take that starting spot, definitely kind of keep the team at a pretty good level, as well as they picked up Wea from the Guangzhou Academy team, T1W. Uh, didn't know too much about them. I don't think they had an overly successful run, but uh, considering they already have Shu in at that primary flex support spot, I don't think we see him, but I don't think that's an issue. All right, so... I guess really the the question here, Blevins, is do you think that there is a a hard ceiling for this roster um, the way it's built right now? Are they going to be able to maintain their momentum and maybe not right out, right away, but can do they have the ability to become an elite roster with the talent that's there right now? Uh, elite, I it would really it's a real stretch for me to see them being elite. I mean, I, I think. You can take what they had. They were showing. They were showing improvement. They made some some changes. Nothing super huge. I mean, they didn't bring in a uh, you know they didn't bring in a superstar. They didn't really lose uh, superstars necessarily. So I, I just don't see a ton of change here. And even if if we just assume they're going to be making some small improvements, I really can't put them in the same echelon. I mean, we think about Soul what they did when we talked about them last episode, like they made big splashy changes that make me really think that they have a, a chance to go from that, like bottom of a top of B tier up to potentially a contender for first place. Um, I don't see that with Guangzhou at all. I think this is a much more like middle of the pack that I could see staying exactly where they are. I could see him making a small improvement. Improvement. I could even see him falling down. I really don't think uh, if, if you're if you're asking is Guangzhou in a position to become an elite team. I mean, we've seen anything. We at, at a point in time, Boston Uprising in season one was an elite team with uh, stage three or stage two. I don't, I don't remember what stage that was. Uh, Boomer Brain, where they had that perfect. They almost. Perfect stage. Uh, I think it was stage three, season one. Yeah, I, I believe so too. Yeah. Um, the four was hot garbage. Yeah, it was three. Correct. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. So, do they have the possibility? Yes, in the sense that anyone has the possibility to do anything if you put your mind to it. But no, is the real answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, to me, these guys are on a similar trajectory right now of the San Francisco shock. And the reason I say that is because they're really kind of just bottom of the pack, but showing some improvement, getting a little better, a little better. What they really need is that spike. And yes. where did that spike come from the San Francisco shock? It came from two acquisitions. One of them was crusty and the other one was Choi Hyo Bin. Yes. So when we look at this roster and we ask, does it have the ability to be elite? I have to ask myself, is Krong as good as Choi Hyo Bin was uh, when he got signed? Because if he is, that could be something that that makes a jump. I also think that Tuno is mechanically gifted enough that he represents a significant upgrade if they decide to go with him. Um, so I'm by no means predicting them to to make a jump like that. Obviously, that's that's a really really difficult ask. And San Francisco, I think, has more talent in the other spots of the roster. Um, but this team really did come together a lot, um, and it, it's. Hard to remember them as good as they were at the end um, because it was for such a short period of time, right? It right. was really just stage four where they really seemed to click. But their DPS core is, is I think, really, really strong. Um, and that's what I remember being the biggest fan of. I'm mm -hmm. ecstatic to see that still intact. Um, but, yeah, to me, the, the whole thing hinges on the off tank. You know, the elite teams in this league have the best off tanks in the league for the most part. And I don't think that is a coincidence. I think it's possible to be an elite team without an elite off tank, right. but I just think there's so much, um, work that that position is able to do. They're able to, to be a band-aid and to, to mask so many deficiencies um, with the play from that one particular position that I think you have to, in order to see this team make that big of a jump, I think you're going to have to see Krong be that good. Um, and I, 
don't think we've seen enough from him in contenders to think to really be betting on that. You know, there's right. a couple players that I think people want to bet on um, sparkle and uh, alarm mm-hmm. are two of them right mm-hmm. coming in this year. And, and Krong is just not on that level. He's not had that separation uh, from the, right. from his peers in tier two um, to really expect it possible. Sure. Um, but I think maybe, you know, we need to see a little bit more, right. I would have mm-hmm. needed to see either, a huge name player come in, you know, if they'd landed fury, for example, right. I think maybe we could have had that conversation um, a little bit more realistically, but um, yeah, I guess let's look at the anticipated records here. We probably got to be a little fast. We had a, a couple yeah, of uh, earlier. Right? Yeah. We're uh, yeah. You're, well, you're I'll just rip the bandaid <laughs> off. I'm going to give, they were 15 and 13 last year. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to say they, don't maintain their momentum. They there is a significant drop off. Maybe not even significant, right? Because I'm I'm lowering everybody's. I think they'll stay about what they were. Maybe a slow start while they integrate new pieces and then stronger at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. I'll go 13 and 15, but um, potential again to be a dangerous team. Maybe coming in through play in something like that. Yeah, in my mind, this team was the LA Gladiators or. Uh, at some points in the season, the LA Valiant of season one, which is right smack dab in the middle of the pack. I'm imagining I'm putting, I'm going to be putting them right smack dab in the middle of the pack in my power rankings. And uh, I do think with that, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'll give them a 500 record, slightly better than you. I'll give them a 14 and 14 record, but I'm really, it's one of those like, I don't actually believe that number specifically. It's just the average of what I think. <laughs> like sure. it's right in the middle of their their high and low, uh, yeah. which puts them right in the middle at fourteen and fourteen for me. So yeah, a team that probably will vary in power level consistently, meta by meta, or yep. you know, as as the season wears on. So um, very hard to pin down they are because there's reasons to be optimistic and there's reasons to think they didn't do enough in the off season. So why did why did you just say that like a pirate? Very p- hard to pin down they are. I don't know. I didn't even know I did. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to work it in uh, more, though. Yes, yeah, so we need more pirate death blow. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get really. I mean, you didn't say it in that voice, but yeah. Okay, let's move on and <laughs> let's talk about the Philly Fusion, one of the most controversial off-season teams. Uh, Ooh, ain't kidding. Yeah, Neptuno leaves. EQO leaves. Kib and Elk, or KYB and Elk, leave. They get themselves a new coach and and Rostin. Um, or KDG, I'm sorry, Rostin is their uh, assistant GM. My apologies there. Um, then they announce their full roster, and it gets people pretty excited. Blevins, Alarm, yeah. Funny Astro, Fury, and Ivy are on the team. EQO is back. And, of course, Carpe was retained as well. Um, so locked up the pieces that people wanted them to, to keep around, maybe – up, I think honestly, probably upgraded in some places where nobody thought they needed to upgrade, but mm-hmm. managed to pull it off anyways, right? Um, you know, funny Astro and and um, Alarm coming in. Alarm is one of those guys. He's he's up there mechanical skill wise. There's not much you can show from that position that he hasn't shown in contenders. So it's a matter of living up to that hype on the main stage. You know, those are the kind of bets you want to be taking. But Boombox didn't go anywhere. So they still have the ability to fall back on exactly what they've had in that position the whole time. That to me is the perfect way um, to bring in a, a contender's talent like that, right? You, you keep you keep what you had so that it can't be called a downgrade and you right. just add somebody that's a potential upgrade um, and potentially a very, very big upgrade. Um, I'm less sold on the Neptuno for a funny Astro trade. Okay, listen, Neptuno to me held his own was he right there neptuno so i'm much. i'm a i'm a big neptuno <laughs> fan but i think he's lived up to it you yeah. know i honestly yeah. i've never really seen him fall behind uh his mercy was much better than his lucio he's, he's to me one of the the best if not the best mercy players in overwatch league because of the offensive style he brings to the hero right. when it's appropriate it doesn't seem to fail for him blah blah, blah. Had, we've had this conversation a lot yes, um, but have. he did fall <laughs> off a bit on on the lucio play yeah. Um, so that's to me is where funny Astro can come in. Now, 
Funny was here last year. He was on the Atlanta Reign roster, and he wasn't deemed better than than Massa, who's one of my favorite Lucio players. So that doesn't have to be a damning sentence right. or a damning phrase. Um, but I think there's a chance, at least, that Puno is the better player. Um, so it's a slightly al- alarming to me um, that they have no backup for him um is all i'm getting at here right so if it doesn't work then they're in a little bit of a tough spot but um i think it'll at least work reasonably well um ivy is going to be kind of that fill-in guy right mm-hmm. when eqo can't play something um he'll step in there's not much eqo can't play so i don't see that being a major impact um but so we'll go through the maps real fast um 15 and 13 overall match record they were the 10th seed in the plans. 38% win rate on control, yuck. 39% on assault, yuck. Uh, 53% on escort, 63 for hybrid. The bad maps, big breath. <sighs> Paris, 13. Volskaya, 13. Hanamura, 38. Route 66, 33%. Dorado, 40. Oasis, 0. zero. Lujang Tower, 33. Nepal, 40. Ilios, 43. Busan, 45. That's every control map I just listed. And Eichenwald is 35%. Blevins, let's hear what the guys over at Blackwatch Report have to say on the Fusion. Fusion coming in with probably one of the most sought-after uh, Tier 2 pickups uh, with Alarm and then also with Funny Astro. Funny Astro coming over from Atlanta Academy. Um, Alarm coming up from Fusion University. Um, Funny Astro, one of the cleanest Lucio's that I've seen in contenders. Um, phenomenal play while he was on Atlanta. Um, Fusion, big pickup here. I really think that their their support line is getting bolstered just by bringing in Funny. But then they go and they add on Alarm. It was to be expected. Um, Alarm was one of the best flex supports in contenders, and that's across the board. That's all regions. Um and it, there's not much you can say about Alarm that isn't phenomenal. Um, great game sense. Perfect transcendence timing when he's on the, um, the Zenyatta. Just deadly. Ooh, so many times we saw Alarm just turn fights because he would get two to three picks. Um, Fusion doing great things with the support line here. Yeah, Alarm definitely had a, a really great name coming into the start of 2019. I think their last season was a bit difficult because they were playing in Korea, didn't make uh, a great playoff run, didn't make a uh, gauntlet. But I think Alarm is still a fantastic player as well. Another, another Korean contenders player they brought in was Hisu, uh, a hitscan DPS player from Runaway. Incredibly talented. If you need him to play the Reaper, you can. I think he'll also be likely playing um, any sort of. Hanzo, uh, McCree, Widow, Ash, when that comes necessary as well, as Chipsa. They picked up Chipsa. Like, we, we, <laughs> we, we just said a little blip at the end. Also, they picked up Chipsa. <laughs> and and uh, Chipsa. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> fair. I forgot about Hisu. Hisu's the one I forgot about because yeah. everybody's so loud about the Chipsa. Um, Hisu was, was very easy to forget. Um, He's uh, probably not going to make the starting roster very often, but uh, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to see this team play. Um, I'm not, man, I have a really hard time with this because there are just five roster spots. I'm super excited for on this team. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then there's Sato. So I, I've got to ask <laughs> Blevins. Um, I'm hearing the word super team thrown around with this. Astros got those big shoes to fill. Any if if even three quarters of the excitement of the Blackwatch report guys turns out to be accurate, I, they're going to be fine there. I'm I'm a little nervous about main support just because I like the backups and the options, mm-hmm. but it, again, I'm not overly worried there. Can we expect Carpe to return to form in a meta that so far seems really similar to where we left off? Granted, oh, there's likely man. to be a patch, and will Sato be anything other than the ankle weight he's been to this roster since taking over for Fraggy in season one? I mean. Those are my questions. Why would we... I'll answer the second one first. Why would we assume that he's going to be... I mean, the only reason we would assume is that the coaching staff and team and GM staff have more... They've seen more tape on Sato than we have. They've seen him in scrims more than we have. They've insert... They have more knowledge than we do. Uh, But at the end of the day, what we see is what matters. (laughs) You know, we see the stage. We see him be 
uh, consistently mediocre and lackluster, and in fact, just actively not good. Um, so, I mean, the only reason, and this is almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way, the only reason I think that the, he would return to form is that there is that the team has a vested interest in him performing or at that position performing and they didn't sign someone else. So they have this, they must be seeing something that we didn't see or that we're not seeing. That's the yeah. only reason nothing inherently makes me think this there's no, and I'm the, you know, the king of making up stupid or backdoor or elaborate tinfoil hat reasons. I got nothing for you. Sign back Fraggy. Uh, that's sign not going to any Sign anyone's backup. Sign anything. Do something. It's, it's mind-blowing to me that the guy still has a spot on this roster. I can't wrap my head around it. I want to call this a super team. I want to jump up and down and tell San Francisco that they should be terrified. Tell Vancouver they don't have a chance. I want to. And there's five spots on this roster that make you think you can do that. It's just that last one. Bumpers out there, Thorn Rain saying. I was going to say, Thorn brings up a spicy pickup. <laughs> do it. And literally anybody. Like, I just, I don't care anymore. It's so difficult and painful to watch this team will continue to roll this guy out there the one saving grace if you're a fusion fan if you really want to see this succeed is fury might be that good fury actually might be just good enough that he can get them to the point of adequacy at the main tank position just by picking the guy up and putting him on his back and carrying him there um i just I, I struggle to see how this isn't going to be a fatal flaw for this roster. Um, if this was, if this was main support, if this was one of the DPS uh -huh. spots, if this was like the tank lines, not where you can cheap out. You, you can be adequate at main tank and succeed in this league. You can't be bad there and succeed. Right. We've seen it. Uh, we've seen what happened when the, the, gladiators went from bad to very good at main tank. They went from an awful team to a playoff contender. A, a, no, I'm sorry, a playoff participant. Okay. When they, when they went from outright bad main tank play right. to very good main tank play. So the fact that they didn't even try, I, I, what could you possibly be seeing and how drunk off the scrim performances can you possibly be that it matters more than the stage performances? Oh, There's scrum, players Scrooge McScrim buck. There's players that show up in practice. Practice? We talking about pre we are. We're talking about practice. I'm I'm gonna use your AI quote for you there, Blaz. Yes. Um so yes, this it's incredibly frustrating to me this could be one of the most electric fun exciting teams to watch and instead i think it's going to be a season of wasted potential just like season one was just like season two was where they have players that deserve better that are losing games because of who their main tank is they've done they've shown no hesitation or they, they've pulled out all the stops everywhere else except for the one big this would be like if houston still didn't have a tracer player Blevins. yeah it's crazy to me i mean and i mean given that carpe carpe was s tier s plus tier prime top three whatever you want to call it in season one he was not that in goats meta and even when we went away a bit from goats meta came back and was fine not insanely good uh i don't see if the you know what what we're hearing about the meta and what i know you've been you've been grinding a lot of games actually lately uh with the with the group i've seen what we've seen in the meta i i mean carpe is an amazing player but you need a certain you need a certain meta or a certain hero composition to really flex that position yeah. Right, that you, you he's can't... an S tier tracer. He's an S tier widow. He's not a very good reaper. Right. Um, so that's I, what it looks like he's going to need to play. Yeah, it does not. Uh, I mean, we'll see. But again, in the same vein that I'm not 
well, why would I give the benefit of the doubt to Sato? I mean, I'll give a little bit more benefit of the doubt to Carpe just because it's Carpe, but and we've that's ever it. seen it. Right. You're betting on somebody getting back to form that we know they're capable of versus asking a main tank to perform in a, in a capacity he's never once performed at uh, on this stage. So it, it, I don't know. I'll go back to boosting. Um, <laughs> what do you have for a record for this team, Blevins, in 2020? We're going to get so much crap. <laughs> so, I don't, everybody hates boosting. They're not going to hate if I take a shot at that. True. God, we're gonna, uh, uh, God. Um, if I had to take a shot here, I'm a little more bullish on them than Guangzhou. I'm not. I'm. I'm not in super team territory. This team screams of a lot of potential, and I we're paying a lot up front, and we haven't seen the results yet. And I'm very averse to that. Um, so I think, let's say I gave 14, 14, I'll give an extra two wins to Philly here from, uh, from, uh, Guangzhou. I'll give him 16 and 12. The problem, if I saw these compared to the other teams, maybe I'd have better answers, but I think 16 and 12, maybe 15, 13. That's, that's my wheelhouse for them. Yeah, uh, I've got 15 and 13 here. Um, I think they do show some improvement from last year. I think they find some friendly metas for them by the end of the season. Um, but uh, again, they're big, huge, heavy, massive ankle weight uh, named Sato. Uh, and it's yeah. tied around this roster. And I can't think of them as a serious high-end um, elite contention team uh as long as they're carrying that that ankle weight um right. so uh, yeah put them better than mid-tier because man they really did add some some serious mm -hmm. pop-off potential but uh, there's a fatal flaw here and i've seen too many teams with fatal flaws and rooted for them every time <laughs> and houston get it right this time yeah uh, you know to to think that it can just go well because there's talent around them right right uh, and I'm going to get in front of it when they are mediocre and people start talking about alarm as average or whatever, it's probably ridiculous. And it's probably the same conversation we've had about other teams with issues and individuals. Mm -hmm. Like it's it, when you go into a season and you think they have a major flaw and that flaw proves to be the problem, you have to give a break to the rest of the players. I think right. Just, uh, prefacing the season with that reminder here for <laughs> Philly fans. Yes. Don't run all these guys out of town. Run Sato and your GM out of town who kept him for three seasons. Or run them to Toronto, New York, and Houston where we want to see them. Uh, <laughs> nah. But Sato. Don't go. Well, no, 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 no. <laughs> Not Sato. I mean the other players. I mean the other oh, okay. players. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, mean, if run, you want to run run some of those guys to our team, sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Run Carpe right over to – oh, man, Carpe. You don't uh, need him. Let yeah, me I know. was going to say, you know <laughs> No, I want him just so you don't have him. Uh, no, you can. We're both well set on DPS. Yeah, we'll we're about we, don't we don't need we don't need carpet. But let's move on, and we're going to talk about Shanghai Dragons. I believe if you're following along at home, and you're going, what? Where's the Chengdu Hunters? The Chengdu Hunters are the next team they should be talking about. I know, uh, Lord Leslie Cromelston. Crom I know you're watching at home. I just made that name up. That's that character that just said that in that voice. Uh, we're skipping Chengdu right now because there are rumors and leaks floating around. And if you've listened to us before, you know we really don't like to go off of leaks or rumors until they're confirmed, at least very heavily. And they're just not at a point. They're at, They're in that weird middle ground where... It's probably true, but also it could not be. So we just err on the side of if it's not official, it's not there. With that being said, we don't want to give you a completely useless Chengdu if those are true. So we're going to just move Chengdu to another episode once we get some confirmation or confirmation of them being real or fake. Um, we'll talk more about Chengdu then. So just to preface that, we're moving on to Shanghai who uh, has some roster changes here. Death, why don't you talk to us about him? 
Sure. So they did uh, part ways with their head coach and they promoted Moon. Uh, Youngjin left the team. Gamzu left. Coma left. Uh, Dia was downgraded to a two-way player. Fleta was traded for from the Seoul Dynasty. They then signed Stand One, Void, Lee Jai Gon, and Lip. I'd apologize for getting those names wrong, but I'm not actually sorry. Um at least Lee Jai, Lee Jai Gone is probably the one I got wrong. I think I pronounced lip correctly. Um, no, you, but you messed that one up, actually. Yeah, I just got, got three letters. Can't get it right. L-I-P. Um, yeah, so looking last year, uh, there was a 13 and 15 record. It was good for the 11 seed. Uh, two stage playoff appearances in stages two and three. They did win stage three. So uh, a tale of two teams, uh, mm-hmm. the, the goats hating uh, dragons and the DPS loving dragons. Um, but yeah, let's see. 55% on control, 54 for assault, 49 for escort, and 35% win rate for hybrid blevins. That's putrid um yucky yeah yikers uh sub 50 (laughs) percent on anubis i'm gonna stop reading percentages there's too many anubis rialto uh gibraltar route 66 nepal busan hollywood they were oh eight and one on hollywood uh eichenwald and king's row so with the uh let's hear what black watch report has to say before we go into our take i think this is the right button Shanghai Dragons pulling up three players from contenders. And talk about stand one really quick. Um, he was a quick fill in for Team Envy in the showdown after Trill got the call up to Team Envy, or I'm sorry, to the Dallas Fuel. Um, looked phenomenal in the short amount of time that he had to get ready for the team over at the showdown. And then after that, he got picked up for the second season of contenders over at the Gladiators Legion, where he looked great was able to turn around the team, uh, well, help turn around the team, and take them into uh, the gauntlet. I think this is a solid pickup. He may not be the starter, but this is a great backup to have sitting behind your tank line, ready to fill in that spot if need. Yeah, from what little we saw in the tournament that was done in China a couple weeks back, he looked really, really solid for his team, as did Lee Jae Gon, who took in that... Uh, main support spot, and he looked really, really solid. He's a player that came uh, from Runaway. Uh, then another player that got called up was Lip. Uh, played for Blossom for a little bit. I think was their primary Reaper player when we did see him play. Not a fantastic team, but I think he as a player showed up to be pretty solid. Hey, big thanks to Kyle there confirming I did pronounce the name Lip correctly. Um, <laughs> also, Lee Jagon. Um, so yeah, didn't didn't do too bad there. Um, yeah, so Stand One was who Thorn Open talking about. I missed the name. I just wanted to make sure. Let's see. Shanghai Dragons pulling up three players from contenders and talk about Stand One. Really, yep. yeah. Okay, yeah, um, th- that's exactly what they need. So Thorn Rain's um, take is is exactly what Shanghai needs, in my opinion. Right? Uh, we saw this team go from a joke to a contender last season, and when did they do that? When Gamzu joined, and they stabilized uh-huh. their tank line. Um, now he's gone, and I don't think they have any other main tanks on the roster, despite having three off tanks in Void, in Gaguri, and in Envy. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's been a while now they've had three off tanks there's something about this coaching staff this organization they they seem to want to be there uh, in that spot with three off tanks and none of them are for show i believe they used all three of them last year so um i guess the question is blevins when we look at this roster the addition of fleta just about locks up that the dps core is the star here right they're yeah. gonna they're gonna be what carries this team so we i'm wondering if the new additions that. and i'm gonna count Envy and, and Iziaki as new additions yeah. since they were late signings uh, late mm-hmm, in the year last mm-hmm. year. Will the off season, will the ability to game plan with them and work with them for an extended period of time be enough to catapult them to be a consistent top player in the standings and not a meta dependent one? I think so. I, honestly, they look solid here. I mean, again, the days of Owen 40 or Owen 41 or whatever, uh, those are, those are long since gone. They had, the big stage in stage three where they actually won the championship. Like they are one of the few teams that has shown they have the ability to beat all of the other top tier teams. They beat San Francisco, they beat New York and they beat 
uh, Vancouver in those in that stage or in those playoffs in the combination of the two, like they were there. Um, and I, I, I think it's hard to say by adding Fleta and Envy and Iziaki and the other players you mentioned that they got worse or that they're in a worse position than they were. They've almost certainly got to be a better, better position. Now, you make the argument that it was because of the meta. It was because they kind of were ahead of the meta there. Uh, and maybe that's true, but A, maybe it's not. Maybe they just like are in a good position. Maybe like they have the talent to play up at against some of those teams. They don't necessarily have to be the counter. They can play head to head against a lot of these teams with this talent. So, and, you know, with their coaching staff, maybe they can do this again. Maybe they can be ahead of the meta again. Maybe, you know, I, I don't know on that side, but all, all things said, I got a lot of confidence in this team. I do think that they're going to be consistent a minus tier, maybe even a tier. They have the, they have the possibility and the cap, uh, the, the talent on the roster to push to higher than that. Uh, it, it's going to be, it, it, they're going to be a really interesting there. I, I don't know if they would, they can really be considered a dark horse. Cause I think a lot of people are pretty high on them, but they're definitely, you know, they're, if I have to guess, they're going to be better than they were last season for sure. I've um I I really have good uh expectations for this team this year. Yeah, I do too. You know, when we look at this, stand one is is really kind of a um the linchpin uh for what what they're really going to be able to be. Um and I, I do believe that. So uh, I like that he's a player that had good showings on multiple teams, Mm -hmm. right? When you see a guy and we just talked about him, so I'm going to use him, somebody like bumper um, who had success in exactly one location and with one roster and in one very specific style of very, very aggressive play. Yeah. That's a lot more concerning to me than somebody that bounced around around tier two, kept getting called up for different things. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Just kept improving and, and showing uh, good tape. So I don't know much about him personally. I don't have a a long standing relationship watching him, anything like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to a little bit defer to our black watch report colleagues and, and say um, that it'll at least be adequate for them, which to me says they can very likely um, make an improvement or, or get better and and build off of what they've done in the past. I'm going to go. Man, I do kind of really like what they're doing. Thorne sold me on it. I had a lower record initially. I'm going to change it. I'm going to give them 16 and 12 if mm-hmm. my keyboard. Yeah, I was thinking 17 and 11. 16 and 12 is probably the more conservative route. But I really do think they have, like, I mean, man, it's Flutter, man. It's Flutter. And and there's, so much, there's so much pop off in their in their DPS line. How do you not get excited? Yeah, I mean, and it's not just the DPS line. Like, You've got Envy and Izyaki is like I'm, I'm relative like we're people are calling Philly a super team. I'm you know, there's not too many pieces missing from this one right now. No, this is a more balanced, less star powery to me. But I, but I, I'm, I'm with, not on the DPS line, not in the <laughs> DPS line. Yeah, and and Izyaki to is a massive fragger, right? Like I, yeah. to be honest, if you can get him in a Zen meta, uh, I think it could be absolutely massive for this team. I don't, that's, that's my, really my worry with them mm-hmm. is are they consistent across multiple right. metas? Not do they have the talent or the ability to, to peak with everybody else? It's, it's consistency. Yeah. Um, so that's what we've not seen from really any of the players on the roster before. Um, and that's, that's what we have to see now. Um, but regardless, they're going to be a blast to watch, like circle your Shanghai matches early in the season. It's going to be fun. I don't have the, the, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but I hope that they're playing in, uh, Toronto, but yeah, yeah, that would be great. We will be there. Yes. (laughs) Let's, let's move on here to our last team. It is the LA Valiant and I'll run through these ones. Uh, these changes real quick. We had, uh, as we talked about before, Izyaki got transferred to the Shanghai Dragons. I only bring that up. That was a while ago, obviously, last season, but I bring it up because I think it is big. Um, We had, uh, they had a team manager leave. That was T-Bubbles. Then Space, Agility, and Kareev all part ways. We have talked about that uh, extensively as well. Assistant coach, 
Gunba has rejoined the team. Uh, we've got a coaching staff announcement, and then they have their uh, roster for 2020. Dreamer, Apply, Slur, and Lastro join the team. Uh, and then finally, Fact Fiction and Custa leave uh, with Custa retiring from professional Overwatch entirely. Fact Fiction simply leaving the team. Not a lot of good things to talk about here for LA Valiant. What's the Blackwatch report, Trey? So the LA Valiant are definitely a team that is very clearly going for the budget here. Not a lot of huge pickups. Two players that even I barely knew about. Um, but there is one kind of diamond in the rough here that was a player that we had kind of been talking about for a while, and that is Lastro. Played for Sky Foxes for quite a bit. Looked really pretty good. I think he's a player that um, has potential. I'm not going to guarantee it, but he definitely has potential to be a really fantastic flex support. Um, with him as well is Slur from Samsung Morningstars uh, in EU. Appears to be playing that flex support spot as well, but I am not very familiar with this player. I don't have a ton of high hopes for him. Um, same with Dreamer. Played on Sydney Drop Bears. They're a pretty good team in Australia, um, but he is a Korean player that played for them. I don't know if either of these are super huge pickups, but I think Lastro should be pretty solid. So overall, I don't think we can expect a whole lot from this team, but they do have potential to get a couple of uh, good performances here and there. Hmm. That screams Boston po- to me. <laughs> they found more positivity than I can. Last season, this team was 12 and 16, which was good for the 13 seed. Missed the play ins by one spot. Really an impressive run considering yeah. they were winless in stage one. I believe yeah. it was stage one. One of the stages they were they were winless. So yeah. um, a massive turnaround from this team last year. Um, I'm going to skip over all the map data because. I that was think, a different team that had those maps. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think <laughs> McGrady is the only one left um, from that roster, and he didn't play uh, for this team last year. Yeah. So um, not a whole lot of positivity surrounding this team. Blevins, can you find any? I mean, the only thing is what I mentioned right after hearing what Kyle kind of put into perspective. It's like this feels like a very Boston season one team, and – that is not the type of team that you bet on uh or or rather it is the type of team that you bet on only because it is a good value to bet on them this is the uh the high noon flip the uh you're getting good odds so put your money in cuz it's good money here but man this is the budget team this is the um i'm trying to think who we what team was it gladiators I'm trying to f- remember what team I uh, had where, like, this looks like a season four team. This is a, like, this season they're taking off. They did, they, like, I don't remember if they publicly announced it or they talked about their philosophy for the team this year, but it is budget. There's no way that you can think it's not. They got rid of their star power or their star power left, however you want to look at it, whatever was true. Uh, they picked up people who even the Blackwatch report are not super familiar with. And that is tough because those guys are grinders and they know everything. So when they're, when we're getting to the outer bounds of what Blackwatch report knows, uh, you're getting into some obscurity and that could be good. That could mean they have some hidden talent that people don't know about. They might have some different perspectives. They might have this, that, or the other thing. What it's not is guaranteed success, and what it's not is um, it is not uh, confidence from your fan base or from the uh, third party bystander, uh, aka us. I'm not going to look at that and 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 think, oh, their best case scenario is uh, Boston of season one. Okay, that's best case scenario. Literally. Uh, 90% of the people we talked to had Boston as the dead last team in season one. And almost everyone, if not everyone that you would ask would say, uh, there's no one that predicted that Boston did what they did. Does that discredit Boston? No. What it says is that it maybe wasn't a fluke, but it's not something that you can predict. You don't look at that team and go, Oh, well, this reminds me of Boston, which is that Boston was bad. It reminds me of the Boston was bad, not the doesn't remind me of Boston because I think that this team can explode. 
I think that they have the that potential because the only direction they can go is up. <laughs> like it's not in anything inherent in it. It just it looks like a random smattering of players that I know very little about. And the first thing I think of when I think of that line is Boston season one. So, uh, yeah, all I have for Valiant fans here is uh, some lyrics inspired by their new main tank. Um, you know, I'm a dreamer. Okay. But my heart's of gold. I had to run away high so I wouldn't come home low. Just when things went right. It doesn't mean they were always wrong. Just take the song and you'll never feel left all alone. Um, I think that's going to be kind of your, you're going to have to sing that to yourselves a lot this season. It's Home Sweet Home by Motley Crue. Oh, Oh, Home Sweet Home. Okay, got it. You got it. Uh, Don't make me sing anymore. Nobody nobody appreciates (laughs) (laughs) that. That was our fan base dying when you you (laughs) sang. (laughs) <laughs> and they're gone okay great um yeah no i mean th- it's gonna be a rough go for uh, for this team um you're gonna feel left all alone because everybody you fell in love with over the last two seasons is gone they dropped them yep. like a bad habit and got mm-hmm. rid of them that include that includes one of the best off tank players in the world in space that mm-hmm. includes dps player i mean they got they got rid of soon after last year now they're getting rid of agility is there just anything you had that you liked is is gone um you in london should form a support group or something like that <laughs> it's it's just i don't i don't know i can't wrap my head around it even if you wanted to go for a budget kind of a feel fact fiction was on your roster uh right. so i just i re- i struggle to even wrap my head around it from a budget perspective did you sign him to such a high contract to come in in the middle of the season it, like it just it, it doesn't make sense to me there were pieces they could have kept and used um it would have been smarter to hold on to some pieces like space even if you were going to have a rough season mm-hmm. i just I, I really struggle to to wrap my head around what's going on here um something to watch for i really want to see apply play again um mm. a, a short a brief stint with the florida mayhem isn't really a fair shake in the league um right. and it was a brig meta specifically and this is supposed to be a dps player he was a pretty solid brig considering the environment he mm-hmm. was on and what was going on around him um so i, I do want to see him strut his stuff a little bit maybe on some damage characters and uh and like I wish he could find better teams to play for, but yeah. we'll, we've got what we've got, and hopefully we get an extended look at him so we can try to see through the team performance and find out right. what he's got to, to give us here. The one, the last thing that I'll say before we talk about our anticipated records is this as well. As, oh, it was London that I was talking about, of course, uh, before about it being a season four team. The one thing I'll say about this uh, is that this and London uh, are pretty shining examples of what people uh, like. These are these are examples that people should give when they talk about having leagues with relegation, like non-traditional sports leagues. Like this type of thing doesn't happen when there's relegation because if your team stinks you get kicked out of the league. You don't get to take a season off, right? So you're trying to build the best team every season. Uh, now, I mean, we've talked about that and we, I don't want to go, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Yeah, we're I'm over. Just, I'm biting back my rebuttal. Don't worry. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just saying this is an example you could give. Now there's probably rebuttals. That we'll talk about them some other time, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah. DB, what do you Eight think? And 20. Eight what do you and got? 20. Yeah, I'm, I'm expecting them to blow the roster up and change it midseason, and that's how they're getting four of those wins. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I think I got to agree with you. Eight and twenty sounds low, but reasonable. sounds awful. Let's go. I don't feel honestly. comfortable giving worse well, than that. But part of me yeah, wants to. Yeah, because they get home. Well, the problem is, is like they've not performed in their home games before, so it's not even that. So yeah, no, I, I think you're. I think you're right. Eight and twenty sounds. Yeah. The, sounds if there's a team that's not going to get much of a home boost, it's this one, um, just because of what the yeah, how uninspired the, the fan base will be. Right. The fact they've had two years of home matches and the, their home markets are uniquely. Um, 
more sick of Overwatch League. Maybe that's right. not accurate, but right. you know they're less excited for Saturated. it. Than yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not as special for them. Yeah. Um, although the homecoming might be pretty big for them, considering that they had that and then it was taken away and then they get it back. So I don't know. Uh, but yeah, not not very bullish on the Valiant. But I am bullish about this being the end of the show. This has been one of our longer ones recently, but we had some stuff to talk about. So thank you everyone who has stuck around and listened this long guys. You can always check us out everywhere on the internet. High noon podcast. Check us out at patreoncom slash high noon podcast as death blow showed the fruits of your support are being put to use with stuff and part PC parts. And we're going to be doing more content and death blow ramping up that content. Get that new PC, baby. Let's go. Um, so yeah, let us know, um, let, let death blow know what kind of stuff you want to see. Cause I know. Yeah. What kind of content do you guys want he on YouTube? Always wants to please you guys. And, uh, all feedback and any suggestions are always, uh, always taken by us. So, uh, or at least considered. So really will appreciate that. But that is going to be it, guys. Let us know what you thought about all that stuff on Discord. Discord.me slash High Noon Podcast. High Noon Podcast everywhere else as well. But for Death Blow, I am the Bluffins. And, guys, remember, it's High Noon. Let us know in Discord who you think the He got his boots I can't and he it. put on his okay. hat He threw the coin away that same day It's in his past and he's not looking back He says, finding mine now guides my way He's not good, but he sure ain't bad He'll make amends for the sins that he has He says, I'll change the world